In this video, we're going to cover Chapter 3 of Accounting 101, Adjusting the Accounts. The learning objectives for this chapter are 1. Explain the accrual basis of accounting and the reasons for adjusting entries. 2. Prepare adjusting entries for deferrals. 3. Prepare adjusting entries for accruals. And 4. Describe the nature and purpose of an adjusted trial balance. So to talk about accruals and deferrals, the first thing we need to understand is that accountants divide the economic life of a business into artificial time periods. This is called the time period assumption. So as you see in this chart, we have January and then January, February, March lumped together and then January through December. So the typical um, time periods are a month, a quarter, or a year, as shown in the chart. Alternatively, the time period assumption is also called the periodicity assumption. Okay, all that states is that we divide the econ economic life of a business into artificial time periods. Monthly and quarterly time periods are called interim periods. Okay, so it's in between major um, financial statement dates. Most large companies prepare must prepare both quarterly and annual financial statements. Okay, they typically do monthly as well, but it's more internal. Um, any company that's listed on the U.S. Stock Exchange has to do the quarterly reporting and produce financial statements each quarter, and then for the for the year, their annual financial statements as well. The fiscal year is in the accounting time period that is one year in length. And a calendar year is January 1 to December 31st, matches the calendar. <clears throat> so we're going to talk, and most of what we're going to cover in this class is that each time period is a month, and it matches the calendar. So it's going to mirror the calendar. Um, so January 1st to January 31st is a month, February 1st to February 28th, etc. So the other way you can do it is some companies do different types of different lengths of time into months and periods and that type of thing. So, so there's some companies that do four, four, five. So first period is four weeks, second period is four weeks, the third period and a quarter is five weeks. Okay, so that gives you your 13 weeks in a quarter, which is typically what three months is. And they just go through each uh, period and each cycle that way. Um, Kate, and then every once in a while, they have to have an extra week or an extra few days to catch back up to the calendar. They want to mirror the calendar as best they can, uh, even though it's not exactly um, the same as the calendar. Okay. Partly they do this to try and get um, more consistent basis year over year, quarter over quarter, that type of thing. Um, so you do see some companies do things like that. Um, a lot of companies are doing the January 1st to December 31st as their fiscal year. Uh, some industries, um, they move that. Retail, for example, typically doesn't end on December 31st because the November, December are their big sales months, and then they have a lot of returns uh, coming in January after the holidays, so they want to include those returns in their results. So they may shift and be at end of January, end of February, um, uh, fiscal year ending. Um, so it doesn't have to mirror the calendar, um, even if they take each month, calendar month as a period, um, that they don't have to have 12 months in a row, January to December. So most of what we cover in class is that, um, you know, we're going to follow the months and follow the, the fiscal year equals the calendar year. But just be aware that there's uh, companies out there that have different um, time periods and different, um, uh, different fiscal years. So question. The time period assumption states that, is it A, revenue should be recognized in the accounting period in which it is earned? Expenses should be matched with revenues. The economic life of a business can be divided into artificial time periods. Or the fiscal year should correspond with the calendar year. Three of these statements are true, but 
the answer is C, the economic life of business can be divided into artificial time periods. Okay, the first two are true statements. Doesn't mean that they're not the time period assumption. Um, so it's not the correct answer for this, but we'll get into how those are true um, in a little bit here. Accrual basis accounting. Okay, so we're gonna talk about accrual basis versus cash basis accounting. In accrual basis, transactions are recorded in the periods in which the events occur. Companies recognize revenues when they perform services rather than when they receive cash. Expenses are recognized when incurred rather than when paid. Okay, so all of these are saying that your revenues and expenses happen when you perform the services for revenue, provide a good um, expenses are matched with those revenues and recognized when incurred. Cash basis accounting, on the other hand, revenues are recorded only when cash is received. So even if you perform a service um, today, if the customer doesn't pay you um, for um, you know six weeks, you recognize the revenue when you receive that cash in six weeks, not today when you perform the service. Expenses are recorded when cash is paid. Okay, so if you take out um, advertising, for example, uh, in a newspaper, um, online, the ad may run uh, starting tomorrow, but on a cash basis, if you don't pay that until April, you recognize the expense in April, not when the advertisement ran. Cash basis accounting is not in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Okay, so most of what we cover in this class is gonna be accrual basis. Uh, we just wanted to point out what the differences are between cash basis and accrual basis. Um, some com companies are typically smaller, um, uh, you know, sole proprietorships or some small partnerships will follow cash basis just because it's easier. Um, but if it's a larger company and they're following GAAP, especially publicly traded companies, they can't use cash basis accounting for their books. Recognizing revenues and expenses. We're going to start with the revenue recognition principle. We'll talk about this a few times throughout the class. Um, we'll get introduced to it here. Just remember that we're going to just touch the service on revenue recognition. Okay, you could spend a whole semester or longer talking about rev revenue recognition. That's a big topic. Um, FASB and the International County Standards Boards um, have changed revenue recognition rules over the years and they will probably continue to evolve those, um, especially as new types of revenue streams are introduced with the internet and online stuff and that type of things. Um, we have to relook at what uh, when you recognize revenue. So generally recognize revenue in the accounting period in which the performance obligation is satisfied. Okay, that means when you've completed everything you need to do for that piece of revenue. So if you take a landscaping business, for example, um, if you're contracted to uh, mow, the, mow someone's lawn every week, you recognize revenue each time you mow the lawn. So every week you're gonna recognize part of the revenue. It's independent of when uh, the customer pays you. They may pay you before, they may pay you after, um, but it's when you complete that work, okay? In a non-service business like a clothing store, it's whenever you deliver those goods and um, complete your obligation for the sale. So. Um, once you make the sale and the customer walks out with their clothing, then the, your performance obligation is satisfied. So on the right there, we have three kind of points within revenue recognition. It's when the customer requests service, when the service is performed, and then when cash is received. Okay, this shows it that they request to perform it and cash received, could get cash up front, that type of thing. The idea is that there's three distinct um, activities happening and the revenue recognition is done when service is performed. <clears throat> Ex 
expense recognition principle. The idea here is that you match expenses with the revenues in the period when the company makes an effort to generate those revenues. Okay. What does that mean, really? It's let the expenses follow the revenues. So if you pay a salesperson to sell some products, you recognize the salaries to that salesperson in the month that they perform those services because they're trying to generate revenue in, the, in that period. Okay. So you look at the chart over here, recognize expenses and the efforts are made. So you have utilities in an office or in a factory, you have delivery costs that happen to get the goods to a customer, you do advertising, you recognize those in the month that they happen and all of that are efforts to generate revenue. <clears throat> okay, here's a graphic that kind of shows this the time period assumption as the economic life of business and divided into artificial time periods. Revenue recognition principle, you recognize revenue in the accounting period which the performance obligation is satisfied. The expense recognition principle, you recognize the expense in the period that efforts are made, so you tie that with the revenues, okay? And both of these are done in accordance with GAAP, the generally accepted accounting principles. Question, one of the following statements about the accrual basis of accounting is false. Which statement is that? So A, events that change a company's financial statements are recorded in the periods in, when, in which the events occur. Okay, that's a true statement. So you record the revenue and the expenses in the, in the periods which they occur. B, revenue is recognized in the period in which the performance obligation is satisfied. Okay, again, that's true. We saw that when we talked about revenue recognition, that that's, that's the key is when the performance obligation is satisfied. C, the accrual basis of accounting is in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Again, that's a true statement. Cash basis is not in accordance. The accrual basis is. And D, revenue is recorded only when cash is received and expenses are recorded only when cash is paid. Okay, that's the cash basis of accounting. That's not accrual basis. So the answer is D, that's the false uh, statement. Okay, Apple. So Apple was required until just recently to um, take the sales of their iPhones and spread that over a two-year period. Okay, so if you went and got a new iPhone, Apple showed that they sold an iPhone, but they couldn't rec record the whole revenue amount when that, w when that event happened. Okay, the reason was that because of software updates and that type of thing, they were obligated, they had some obligations to continue after the initial date. So they had to wait for those two, two year period to complete those obligations, okay? New um, uh, rules came into effect. They're able to record more iPhone sales at the point of sale. So if you looked back at their statements, their financials, under the new rule, revenues would have been about 17% higher, earnings per share almost 50% higher than what they reported if they used this new rule. So going forward, they're going to see an uptick in that, um, but it's not going to be, you know, good apples to apples comparisons because some rules changed. So why was it argued that Apple should spread the recognition of iPhone revenue over a two-year period rather than recording up front? Again, they promised to provide software updates, and um, it may go past the two years, but they picked two years as a... Um, basis so they had unfulfilled performance obligation and that they should spread the revenue over that um, two-year life. Adjusting entries. Okay, why do we need adjusting entries? Well, we need to ensure that revenue recognition and expense recognition principles are followed. Okay, so we talked about um, making sure expenses are recorded in the right periods, revenues are recorded in the right periods. 
just going through transactions day to day, we may not get, may not follow those principles. So we have to do adjusting entries. The trial balance may not contain up to date and complete data. Okay, same idea as that when we book transactions as they happen, there are some things that we have to adjust because of that. And it's required every time a company prepares financial statements. And adjusting entries will include one income statement account and one balance sheet account. So that's a good key, a, a good thing to keep in mind as you do the adjusting entries. You're going to have one income statement. You're going to have one balance sheet account that get impacted. If you're trying to do adjusting entry that doesn't have one of each, then you've done, you're doing the entry wrong or you don't need to do that entry. Another question, adjusting entries are made to ensure that A, expenses are recognized in the period in which they are incurred. B, revenues are recorded in the period in which the services are performed. C, balance sheet and income statement accounts have correct balances at the end of, the, of an accounting period. Or D, all of the above. The answer is D, all of the above. All three of those statements are correct and the reasons why we do adjusting entries. There are two different types of um, adjusting entries. There's deferrals and there's accruals. Deferrals, we have the expense side, we have revenue side. On the expense side, prepaid expenses. It's where you pay expenses in cash before they are used or consumed. So you have to do an adjusting entry to recognize that you uh, incurred that expense. Under revenue, it's where cash is received before services are performed. You then do an adjusting entry once those services are performed. Accruals, you have accrued revenues, you have accrued expenses. Accrued revenues are revenues for services performed but not yet received in cash or recorded. And accrued expenses are expenses incurred but not yet paid in cash or recorded. Okay, I like to think about it as accruals are normal transactions. You record it like you would normally do as you incur it, um, but just at the end of the accounting period, they haven't been recorded. So you have to make that a, a recording, make that adjustment to book them into the books. Whereas the deferrals, cash has exchanged hands already. So you either paid it out in a prepaid expense or you received it for a customer. Then the activity happens and you have to then record that activity and take it off of the balance sheet. Each account is analyzed on the trial balance to determine whether it's complete and update up to date for financial statement purposes. Okay, so if we look at this, um, we can go through each account and say, you know, do we have the right amounts? You know, you're gonna focus on um, certain accounts, but you do look at almost all of them as you go through. So revenues, expenses, you're gonna look and see if you have all those. Supplies, you're gonna see, look and see what you have left. Prepaid insurance, did you use, in, use up any the insurance because of time going by um, uh, and that type of thing. Unearned service revenue here. Um, did you earn any of that revenue that you received? So we have a matching um, uh, problem here. So concepts are on the left. The definitions on the or descriptions on the right. We have to match those up. So accrual basis accounting, that would be F, companies record transactions in the period in which the events occur. Okay, so that's accrual basis. Calendar year. Calendar year is an accounting time period that starts on January 1st, ends on December 31st, and matches the calendar um, for the year, um, and it's not a, a separate fiscal year, uh, different dates. Three is the time period assumption. And that's C, a 
accountants divide the economic life of a business into artificial time periods. And four, the expense recognition principle. And that's B here, efforts or the expenses should be matched with the results, which were the revenues. Okay, so there's the answers. Okay, learning, obje learning objective two, we're gonna prepare adjusting entries for deferrals. Okay, again, deferrals are expenses or revenues that are recognized at a date later than the point when cash was originally exchanged. Two types that we talked about, prepaid expenses and unearned revenues. Okay, so we will get into some examples of these, how you prepare the adjusting entries and make sure your books are correct. <clears throat> prepaid expenses, payments of expenses that will benefit more than one accounting period. The cash payment is before the expense is recorded. Examples of common prepayments, insurance, supplies, advertising. Okay, so these are examples. We also have rent, buildings and equipment. Examples of where you pay cash for something, but you don't necessarily use it in the period you pay the cash. Um, insurance, for example, you typically play, pay in advance for a insurance policy covers a year, sometimes covers more than one year, um, but you pay up front. So you put a prepayment on your books and you um, each month you recognize the expense. Supplies, you buy a bunch of pens and papers that you're going to use throughout the, um, uh, you know, of doing your business and, and going through. Um, so you, you show the supplies as an asset and then as you use them over time, you recognize expense each time you use it, not each event, but each period. Then you look at how much supplies you used. Advertising rent, same type of thing. Those, those are, um, you know, paid in advance, and the, and the activity happens later. Uh, buildings and equipment is unique. It's depreciation. We'll talk a little bit about that, but we'll get in more details um, of that in a later chapter. I think it's chapter nine that we talk about how we calculate depreciation and, and that type of thing. But um, we'll see how we record that here in this chapter. Costs that expire either with the passage of time or through use. Okay. The adjusting entry is an increase with a debit to an expense account and a decrease, a credit to an asset account. Okay. So you have an asset account, it's got an unadjusted balance, a debit balance. You use up part of that asset or time has expired and you're and you use it up through the passage of time. You debit the expense, credit the asset. You have the correct expense recorded in the period and the asset balance is correct. So let's look at an example. This is for supplies. So Pioneer Advertising purchased supplies costing $2,500 on October 5th. They recorded the purchase by increasing debiting the asset supplies. This account shows a balance of $2,500 on the October 31st trial balance. Okay, an inventory count, which means they went through and saw how much supplies are left at October 31st reveals that $1,000 of supplies are still on hand. Okay, so if you have $2,500 worth of supplies, you do a count and you see that 1,000 is still left. That means you use the difference, which in this case is 2,500. Okay, so if you've used up supplies, you have to record supplies expense. So we're going to debit supplies expense 1,500 and we credit the asset supplies 1,500. Okay, so supplies is a typical uh, prepayment that most companies have. They buy a bunch of things up front um, that they're not going to use all in the one, in one period. So they have to then 
manage how that gets used. Um, if it's office supplies like we're talking about here, then you do it. Um, at the end of the period, you see what's left, make an estimate of what's left, that type of thing, and you record the expense. Um, some supplies in the, in the manufacturing environment are bigger, and you actually record the usage of that supply as you um, use it, if you're repairing a machine or that type of thing. Um, so there's a couple ways to do it. Most of the homework in the exam is going to be this type of uh, example. You have to look at what the ending balance, the pre-adjusted balance in the account is, what the um, balance should be. So 2,500 was the pre-adjusted balance. The balance should be 1,000. So you have to adjust that supplies account to get it to 1,000. The difference goes to supplies expense. And that's how we get the adjusting entry. So here's another example or another way of, of showing this, not the same example. We do the analysis. We look at the accounting equation. We figure out the debits and credits. We do the journal entry. We post that journal entry into the ledger. And here, the supplies account, you see it had a balance of 2,500 before the adjustment. We had a credit of 1,500 from the adjusting entry. And we have a balance of 1,000, which is what um, we showed when we did the inventory count. Another example of prepaid expenses is insurance. Okay, this is a very typical one. Um, company, all, almost all companies have insurance. Um, typically, like I said, they, they pay for uh, a year or multiple years in advance. Okay, so in this case, October 4th, they paid $600 for a one-year fire insurance policy. Coverage began October 1. Pioneer recorded the payment by increasing with a debit, so they debited prepaid insurance. This account shows a balance of $600 in the October 31st trial balance. Insurance of $50 expires each month. Okay, where's the $50 comes from? It's the $600 policy that they paid divided by 12 months because it's a one-year policy so $50 a month over here on the right you see that graphically each month is $50 you add up the 12 months you get $600 so we need to record in the adjusting entry the use of that insurance and that insurance expense okay we debit insurance expense, we credit prepaid insurance. Okay, so we reduce the asset with the credit. So now we only have $550 in that balance in that account, and that's gonna take us the next 11 months. And again, another way to look at it, the analysis, the accounting equation, debit and credit analysis, the journal entry, and then posting to the ledger. Okay, one thing to point out is all the adjusting entries are dated the last day of the month. Okay, so we're dealing with the month of October in these examples, so all the journal entries are dated October 31st. Depreciation. <clears throat> Depreciation is a is a unique, special kind of prepaid expense. Okay, Buildings, equipment, motor vehicles, their assets that provide service for many years are recorded as assets at the cost, and the historical cost concept that we talked about in chapter one. They're recorded as assets rather than expense on the date acquired. Depreciation is the process of allocating that cost cost of that asset or to expense over the useful life. Okay. Depreciation does not attempt to report the actual change in the, the value of the asset. Okay. So we're not trying to say the, the asset is worth less. Sometimes it does. Uh, it is worth less as we use it. Sometimes over time, a building or, or land will go up in value over time. So we're not trying to, with depreciation, um, uh, you know, change the value of the asset. We're just saying, here's the cost that we paid for that asset, the amount that we paid, the 
cost and we're taking that to expense over time. Okay. So adjusting entry for depreciation. Assume that depreciation on the equipment is $480 a year or $40 per month. Okay. Chapter nine, we'll learn how we calculate those amounts. Uh, but just for this chapter, you need to know that you'll be given how much depreciation is either for the year or for the month um, and that type of thing. The entry to record depreciation is to debit depreciation expense and credit depreciation equipment or should should read a, accumulated depreciation equipment okay accumulated depreciation is a contra asset account okay contra accounts are paired with an existing account in this case contra asset depreciation accumulated depreciation is going to be paired with the equipment account but it has its increases decreases in normal in normal balances opposite to the account which they relate contra so it's it's the opposite okay so if we look at this graphically forty dollars a month is depreciation four hundred and eighty dollars for the year so we're showing that we have an expense for that equipment that we're using at forty dollars a month we're recording depreciation expense increasing or recording accumulated depreciation. Again, here's a chart. You do the analysis, you look at the uh, accounting equation, <clears throat> debit and credits. So we debit depreciation expense, we credit the contra asset accumulated depreciation equipment. Here's the journal entry to record that. Then we post it into the ledger. Notice we have this equipment account, and that's what we're um, spreading the cost of. That's the cost of this equipment we're putting to expense with this depreciation expense, but we don't impact this account. This account stays at its historical cost. Okay, we have this new account accumulated depreciation equipment where we show the accumulation of the depreciation expense. So we just have one month of depreciation expense. We have one month in accumulated depreciation as a credit. This credit will build as we go through time and reduce the net cost of the equipment, but we don't change the, we don't impact the equipment account. So how do we show this on the statement? Accumulated depreciation is a contra asset account. It's a credit instead of a debit balance. It appears just after the account it offsets. So in this case, equipment. The book value is the difference between the cost of any depreciable asset and its accumulated depreciation. For our example, the equipment cost is $5,000. We've recorded one month of depreciation of $40. So accumulated depreciation account equipment is a credit of 40. So 5,000 minus the 40 is 4,960. The book value of the equipment is that 4,960. That's the net value between the two accounts, the equipment and the accumulated depreciation. So as a review, prepaid expenses, some ex examples, insurance, supplies, advertising, rent, depreciation. Reason for the adjustment, prepaid expenses originally recorded in asset accounts. Those assets have been used accounts before adjustment so before we make the adjustments our assets are overstated okay so we have more in our assets than we should and our expenses are understated because we haven't recorded the expense for that item yet and the adjusting entry is to debit expense credit assets or in the case of depreciation a contra asset Unearned revenues, okay. receipt of cash that is recorded as a liability because of the service has not been performed. So cash is received before revenue is earned. 
Okay, this is the liability account. I touched on it earlier in the previous chapter. It's a liability account, but it's one of those rare liability accounts that doesn't have payable in it, the account named. It's under earned revenue, but it's still a liability. Okay, what are some examples of under revenues? We have rent, airline tickets, magazine subscriptions, customer deposits. Okay. All of these um, are examples or could be examples of where the customer pays the company first before they get the benefit or before they get the um, service or the goods. So if you think about airline tickets, um, if you're planning a spring break trip, you might be buying your ticket or you may have already bought your ticket. Um, you've paid the money to the airline, but you haven't taken the flight yet. The airline cannot recognize that money as revenue until they actually take you on the flight that you purchased the ticket for. Okay. Once you take the flight, then they can take that money, the value of that flight that they charge you and show that as revenue. Adjusting entry is made to record the revenue for services performed during the period and to show the liability that remains at the end of the accounting period. Okay, we decrease or debit the liability account, under earned revenue liability account, and we increase credit the revenue account. Okay, so we're recognizing the revenue completed our performance obligations, we recognize revenue, we've received the cash ahead of time, so we have this liability on our books, we decrease that liability. So an example, Pioneer Advertising received $1,200 on October 2nd from Arnox for advertising services expected to be completed by December 31st. Under service revenue shows a balance of $1,200 in the October 31st trial balance. That makes sense because that's the amount we received. When we received the money, we debited cash, we credited under service revenue. The analysis reveals that the company performed $400 of services in October. Okay, so if they've performed $400 of services, we're going to debit unearned service revenue $400 because we no longer have that liability and we're going to record service revenue because we perform those services $400. Okay. And here's the chart that shows that the analysis, the equation analysis, debit credits, journal entry, and then posting the journal entry to the ledger. And you see we've increased service revenue $400. We've decreased the liability under in service revenue $400. We still have $800 left. So we still have additional services that we need to perform for this customer. Under in revenue examples, again, rent, magazine subscriptions, customer deposits for future service. Under and revenues recorded in the liability accounts recognize as revenue for services performed. So you collected money from a customer in advance. You have performed some service for them. So you have to recognize that you perform that service. Before the adjustment, your liabilities are overstated and your revenues are understated. So the adjusting entry is a debit to liabilities to decrease it. So they're no longer overstated. Credit revenues, increased revenues, revenues are no longer understated. Here's an example in real life. So Best Buy, gift cards. A lot of times people buy gift cards to give um, as gifts. Um, you know, they're saying that gift card sales were expected to exceed $124 billion. Okay. The, the idea around this or the, what we're talking about it is when should we record the revenue? Is it when the gift card is sold or when it is exercised? How should expired gift cards be 
accounted for. If you look at the Best Buy balance sheet, a recent one, they reported under revenue related to gift cards of $427 million. Okay, so a lot of gift cards out there that haven't been exercised yet, they show that as a liability. So, suppose that Robert Jones purchases a $100 gift card at Best Buy on December 24th, gives it to his wife Mary on December 25th, and January 3rd, 2022, Mary uses the card to purchase $100 worth of CDs. When do you think Best Buy should recognize the revenue and why? The answer is that according to revenue recognition principle, they recognize the revenue and performance obligation is satisfied. Okay, so when Best Buy received the cash on December 24, 2021, it needs to recognize a liability under and sales revenue. Then on January 3rd, 2022, when Mary Jones exchanges the card for merchandise, Best Buy can recognize revenue eliminate the $100 um, balance of the liability in their unearned sales revenue account and show that as revenue. Okay, so here's some examples we'll go through. So we have a partial listing of the um, uh, trial balance. So it's just a few accounts and what their balances are. Unadjusted trial balance, we haven't done the adjusting entries. We do analysis of those accounts and we learn these four things. Insurance expires at the rate of $100 per month. Supplies on hand total $800. Equipment depreciates $200 a month. And during March, services were performed for $4,000 of the unearned service revenue. We now need to prepare the adjusting entries for each of these items. Okay. First one, insurance expires at the rate of $100 per month. If we looked at the trial balance, we have a prepaid insurance account. It's got a debit balance of $3,600. Insurance expires at the rate of $100 per month, which means that each month we've incurred $100 worth of insurance expense. So we debit insurance expense $100. We credit prepaid insurance 100. The next one, we had supplies on hand total $800. So if we look at the supplies account, $2,800 debit and supplies, we only have $800 on hand. So that adjusted balance should be $800. In order to get this debit of $2,800, to a debit of 800, we need to credit supplies $2,000 and, or credit supplies $2,000, debit supplies expense $2,000. That's the $2,800 that we have in the balance minus the $800 that's on hand, what's left. That's where we get the $2,000. The next one, equipment depreciates $200 a month. Okay, so we, we have to record depreciation expense each month of $200. We do that by debiting depreciation expense 200. The account that we credit is this accumulated depreciation equipment for $200. And the last one here, during March, services were performed for $4,000 of the unearned service revenue. So if we look at the trial balance, we have unearned service revenue of 9,200. We performed services worth $4,000 that came out of this unearned service revenue. The entry is to debit unearned service revenue 4,000, credit service revenue 4,000, so we're recognizing the revenue that we've earned and we're reducing our liability under and service revenue. So that's deferrals. Now we'll talk about accruals. 
accruals are made to record revenues for services performed but not yet recorded at the statement date, accrued revenues, or expenses incurred but not yet paid or recorded at the statement date, accrued expenses. Okay, so said it earlier, think about accruals as you're recording a transaction that hasn't been recorded yet. It just hasn't come up in the normal course of the business, so at the end of the accounting period, at the end of the month, you need to make an adjusting entry to record those. Okay. So, accrued revenues, revenues for services performed but not yet received in cash recorded. So the services performed before the cash received. So rent, interest, services performed are examples. The adjusting entry records the receivable that exists at the balance sheet date and the revenue for services performed during the period. Okay, so if you performed a service <clears throat> for a customer, they haven't paid you yet, you have a receivable from that customer. Okay, so you record an accounts receivable, a debit, you increase that asset accounts receivable, and you increase the credit, the revenue account. Okay, it's the same type of entry as if you performed a service and issued an invoice to the customer, you would make the same entry. Okay, this is just happens that you haven't produced the invoice yet, you, re you missed it somehow, or it's late in the period, so you didn't have a chance to, to create the invoice, but you still record it on your books as if you did. So, an example here, in October, Pioneer Advertising performed services worth $200 that were not billed to clients in October. An adjusting entry on October 31st to record accrued revenues. The debit accounts receivable, 200. Credit service revenue, 200. So that's what we recorded on October 31st. Then following on, on November 10th, Pioneer receives cash of $200 for the first service performed in October. So we billed the client, the client paid us. When we receive the cash, we debit cash, credit the accounts receivable. Okay, it's just like any other activity where we perform a service for a customer, send them a bill, record that, and then when they pay it, we record the receipt against accounts receivable. It's just that as we went through the analysis at the end of the accounting period, we realized that we didn't record that invoice, whether we didn't send it or didn't record it, whatever it is, it didn't get into our books, and we need to record that into our books. So again, the graphic here, basic analysis of what's happening, look at the accounting equation, determine the debits and credits, we're going to debit accounts receivable, credit service revenue, create the journal entry, and then post that journal entry into the ledger. So, summary here, examples, interest, rent, services, are all examples of accrued revenues. Reason for the adjustment is that services were performed, but not yet received in cash or recorded. Before the adjustment, assets are going to be understated, so we don't have that accounts receivable recorded. Revenues are understated. We should have been recording revenue that we didn't. So the adjusting entry is to debit assets, credit revenues. <clears throat> A report released by Fannie Mae's board of directors. This is the um, mortgage company, not the candy company. Um, stated that improper adjusting entries at the mortgage finance company resulted in delayed recognition of expenses caused by interest rate changes. Okay, so they didn't correctly do their adjusting entries like they should have. The motivation for such an accounting apparently was the desire to hit earnings estimates. Okay, so they didn't record some of the expenses they didn't accrue for them like they should have, and they showed lower expenses than they should have. Accrued expenses. 
expenses incurred but not yet paid in cash or recorded. So again, the expenses recorded before the cash payment. Examples of accrued expenses are interest, taxes, salaries. So the adjusting entry records the obligation and recognizes the expense. The adjusting entry will increase or debit the expense account to record the expense. An increase or credit a liability account to show that we have an obligation to pay that to a vendor or some outside um, uh, entity. Adjusting entry for accrued ex interest. Okay. Pioneer Advertising signed a three month note in the amount of $5,000 on October 1st. The note requires Pioneer to pay interest at an annual rate of 12%. Okay, so to calculate the interest, and this is a formula that we're going to see over and over throughout the semester, the face value of the note, $5,000, times the annual interest rate, 12%, times times in terms of a year. So in this case, it's one month, one of 12, because that's a one year note or a three month note, but it's only we're taking one month here, $50 interest. Okay, so we're gonna debit interest expense $50. We're gonna credit interest payable $50. Okay, we record the expense. We record the payable, the liability. So we do the analysis, shows that we haven't recorded interest expense. We look at the accounting equation and how we record that, determine what's debits and credits, do the journal entry, and then we post it to the ledger. Okay, again, remember the formula, face value of the note, times the annual interest rate, times times in terms of one year. Typically it's for a month, one month out of 12. There'll be some examples, some uh, problems we have in our homework where it, you're gonna record two months of interest instead of one, so it'll be two twelfths, that type of thing, so just watch that. We'll look at another example of accrued expenses, accrued salaries. This is a typical entry that almost all companies use. Very rarely does the pay periods and when they pay their salaries align with the calendar um, in the accounting periods. So there's always something that needs to be adjusted um, for salaries. So in this example, Pioneer paid salaries and wages on October 26th. So here for the past two weeks, October 15th through October 26th. Okay, so if they're, oops, if they're paying every two weeks, then the next pay period and the next pay date is gonna be November 9th, okay? And that's gonna be for the 29th of October through the 9th of November, okay? Employees receive total salaries of $2,000 for a five-day work week or $400 a day. So at October 31st, we determine that Crude salaries are 1,200, so it's three days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the 29th, 30th, and 31st, times $400 a day, it's $1,200. Okay, so our adjusting entry, it's gonna be $1,200. We're gonna debit salaries expense, credit salaries and wages payable. What does that look like? We do our analysis, calculate what the adjustment should be, $1,200 in this case. Look at the debits and credits, do the journal entry, debit salaries and wages expense, $1,200, credit salaries and wages payable, $1,200. And then we post them to the ledger to get updated balances for those accounts. So summary of accrued expenses. Examples are interest, rent, salaries, reason for adjustments, expenses have, not, have been incurred, but not yet paid in cash or recorded. Before the adjustment, expenses are understated and liabilities are understated. 
So we debit expenses to increase expenses, credit liabilities to increase liabilities. So here's a good summary of the different types of adjustments. The four of them we talked about, prepaid expenses, unearned revenues, the deferrals, accrued revenues, accrued spend expenses, the accruals, what the, is wrong with the accounts before the adjustment? So what's overstated, what's understated? And the adjusting entry, what gets debited, what gets credited in order to correct or record the entry the way it should be, okay? There'll be questions regarding this on the homework as you go through problems on the homework, um, you know, understanding what this relationship is will help you to understand what entries you need to make. Okay, like we did for deferrals, we'll go through some examples and, and record the entries for accruals. So microcomputer services began operations on August 1st, 2022. At the end of August, 2022, Management prepares monthly financial statements. The following information relates to August. So at August 31st, the company owed its employees $800 in salaries and wages that will be paid on September 1st. Okay, so in this example, they're telling you what the amount is. You don't have to calculate it. A lot of times on the homework, um, you might have to calculate how much is owed. On August 1st, company borrowed $30,000 from a local bank on a one-year note payable. Annual interest rate is 10%. Interest will be paid with the note at maturity. Okay, and what that means is that we're gonna accrue the interest, pay it when we uh, pay off the note. So we gotta record the interest expense and the interest payable for that month, for the month of August. Revenue for service performed, but unrecorded for August. 1,100, so we're gonna have to recognize that that revenue uh, was earned and record that revenue. So we need to prepare the adjusting entries for these three items. So the first one, company owed its employees $800, salaries and wages that will pay on September 1st. Okay, we debit salaries and wages expense. The employees have earned that, We've they've, performed services for us as an employee that went towards generated revenue. So we need to match that expense and record that expense, salaries and wage expense. And we record salaries and wages payable because now we have a liability to pay that to our employees. The second one, company borrowed $30,000 from a local bank, one year note payable, 10% annual interest rate, okay? So we have to calculate how much interest, okay? So 30,000 times 10% times 1 12th. So it's one month out of 12, it's $250. Debit interest expense, 250. Credit interest payable, 250. Okay, so we're recognizing the interest expense, showing that we have to pay that to the bank when we pay off the note, so we have an additional liability. We don't put it in the same account as the $30,000. We just show it in the interest interest payable account. Okay. Third one, revenue for services performed with unrecorded for August totaled $1,100. Okay, so we perform services. We haven't recorded it. We show a receivable from our customer, so accounts receivable, debit, 1,100. We recognize the revenue, record the revenue. We debit, serve, or credit service revenue, 1,100. So debit accounts receivable, credit service revenue. Okay, nature and purpose of an adjusted trial balance. Okay. Prepare an adjusted trial balance after all adjusting entries are journalized and posted. The purpose is to prove the equality of debit balances and credit balances in the ledger after all adjustments. Okay, remember, when we look down here, the first trial balance, we proved that debits equal credits after we 
journalized all the transactions and posted them. We created new entries with the adjusting entries. So we posted them to the ledger. So now we have an adjusted trial balance that still that proves again that debits equal credits to make sure it's still um, in balance after we do the adjusting entries. But then we're going to use this adjust, adjusted trial balance as the primary basis for the preparation of the financial statements. Okay, so we're going to create the financial statements off of the adjusted trial balance. So here's an example of the adjusted trial balance. Okay, title, we have the word adjusted in there. Otherwise, it looks just like in a, a, a trial balance that we saw before. We have the accounts listed, the balance in those accounts. If you compare this to the trial balance before we do the adjusting entries, these items in reds are the ones that have changed. So if you go back through um, you know, this PowerPoint, you'll see those adjustments and can tie them in there. So um, the red doesn't mean that was the amount of the adjustment. It means that's the new balance after the adjustment. Okay, salaries and wages expense. We adjusted that, but we didn't adjust it for 5,200. We added it to whatever balance it was. Interest expense, we didn't have interest expense on our trial balance before, but we recorded that interest expense through our accruals. So now it shows up on the trial balance. Debits still equal credits. So which of the following statements is incorrect concerning the adjusted trial balance? A, adjusted trial balance proves the equality of the total debit balances and total credit balances in the ledger after all adjustments are made. That is true. That's what the adjusted trial balance does. So that's the true statement. That's not the incorrect. B, the adjusted trial balance provides the primary basis for the preparation of financial statements. That is true also. We're going to use the adjusted trial balance to um, create our financial statements. We'll see that in a minute here. C, the adjusted trial balance lists the account balances segregated by assets and liabilities. Okay, that doesn't sound right. Let's flip back and look at that. There's no segregation. We just list the accounts. We have debits. We have credits. So we're not segregating between assets and liabilities. So C seems incorrect. So that could be the correct answer for this one. We'll look at D to make sure the adjusted trial balance is prepared after the adjusting entries have been journalized and posted. Correct. We can't create an adjusted trial balance until we do the adjusting entries, so that is correct. So the answer is C. The adjusted trial balance lists the account balances segregated by assets and liabilities. That is not correct, and that's the statement where we're trying to find in this problem. Preparing the financial statements. Financial statements are prepared directly from the adjusted trial balance. We can prepare the income statement, we can prepare the retained earnings statement, and we can create the balance sheet from the adjusted trial balance. Okay. How do we do that? <clears throat> if we look at the income statement here, we list revenues and expenses to get net income. So we look at the trial balance and we identify which accounts are revenues and expenses. We have service revenue. We have a number of expenses. We take those accounts and those balances and we put them into the income statement format and we calculate our net income. Okay, Net income is also used in the retained earnings statement. So the retained earnings statement, we start with beginning retained earnings. So it's the balance on the adjusted trial balance. Okay, We haven't done the closing entries, which we'll learn in next chapter. So the trial balance still shows the revenue and expense accounts. So we know this is the beginning balance. It's a zero. We add net income from the income statement. We subtract dividends from the trial balance. And we get ending retained earnings. So in this case, 2,360. That's going to go to the balance sheet. So on the next page, 
we have retained earnings on the balance sheet that comes from the previous page, the retained earnings statement. We take all of the asset accounts, show them in assets on the balance sheet. We take all of the liability accounts, show them in the liability section of the balance sheet. Common stock is the stockholders equity um, account, so we show it there. Retained earnings through depreciation expense, these ones that are in black here. We've already used them in previous statements, so we don't repeat using them on the balance sheet. The retained earnings comes from the retained earnings statement, like we said, and we put that on there. Total assets, 21,910 equal total liabilities plus stockholders equity, 21,910. So our balance sheet is in balance, the accounting equation is in balance. So, we'll try it again on our own here. The company was organized on April 1st, 2022. The company prepares quarterly financial statements. The adjusted trial balance amounts at June 30th are shown below. Okay, so similar to a um, trial balance, but it's not in the trial balance form, but it has the same information and it has our accounts this lists all the debits and what the debits are. This is the credits, accounts with credit balances and what those are. Debits equal credits. So it's the same as a trial balance, just a little bit different format. So we need to determine the net income for the quarter, April 1st to June 30th. Okay, so it says for the quarter, it says we organize on April 1st. They prepare quarterly financial statements adjusted trial balance as of June 30th. So we know that these balances are indicated in, indicative of what happened from April 1st to June 30th. So for that quarter, we can create the financial statements. So we determine the net income, we determine the total assets and total liabilities at June 30th, and determine the amount of retained earnings at June 30th. So first one, determine the net, net income. We need to identify the revenue accounts and the expense accounts. So revenue has a credit balance. So we look on the credit side. Uh, oops, unearned re revenue. It's got the word revenue, but it's unearned. Okay, so that's that liability account. So that doesn't belong on the income statement. We have service revenue. That's a revenue account that belongs on the income statement and rent revenue is another revenue account belongs on the income statement. So we have two revenue accounts. Look over on the debit side. Expenses have a normal debit balance. We would expect all the expenses to be on this debit side. We look down, we have salaries and wages expense, rent expense, depreciation expense, supplies expense, utilities expense, and interest expense. So if we go to the next slide, we say we have two revenue accounts, the total $15,000. We have all those expense accounts, the total is 12510 Net income is the difference, revenues minus expenses. So 2490 is our net income. Okay. The next question we need to answer is determine the total assets and total liabilities at June 30th. Okay, so we're not creating a full balance sheet. We're just looking at what the total assets and total liabilities are. Okay, so we look at all these accounts and identify which ones are assets. So we start with cash. Yes, cash is an asset. Accounts receivable. Yes, accounts receivable is an asset. Prepaid rent. It's also an asset. Prepaid accounts are assets. Supply, special kind of prepaid um, account, so that's an asset. Equipment is an asset, $15,000. Dividends, is dividends an asset? It's got a debit balance. No, it's a stockholder's equity account that goes into retained earnings. Then we have the expense accounts. We know that the expense accounts we used in the income statement, so we don't include those in the trial balance. So it's cash through equipment, okay? 
any other asset accounts that you see. Okay, there's one more that we have to include, accumulated depreciation equipment. It has a credit balance, but remember this is a contra asset account. So it goes with the equipment account as part of assets. So we're gonna add up these debits. We're gonna subtract this one credit for our total assets. Liabilities, we have notes payable, we have accounts payable, salaries and wages payable, interest payable. Those are easy to see because they have payable in the account. Any account that has the word payable is most likely a liability account. So those are liabilities. But we have one more liability. That's this unearned rent revenue. Okay, it's a liability because we haven't earned that revenue yet. Customers have paid us though. So we have that liability. So we add up these amounts for the liabilities. If we skip ahead, here are our assets, including that accumulated depreciation decrease to get the net book value of equipment. Total assets, 23,350. Our liability accounts, okay. So then the payables, the under rent revenue, and we have $7,460 of total liabilities. But assets don't equal liabilities. Is that okay? Yes, because the accounting equation is assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity, not assets equal liabilities. Okay, so from this, we can actually figure out what stockholders equity would be. It would be the difference between the 23,350 total assets and the 7,460 total liabilities. That difference is our stockholders equity. Okay, we weren't asked for that, but we know we can calculate it from that information. And the last one is to determine the amount of retained earnings at June 30th. Okay, remember, retained earnings is the retained earnings statement is beginning retained earnings plus net income minus dividends. Okay, so if we look at the adjusted trial balance, I don't see a retained earnings account anywhere on here. That makes sense because we just started on April 1st, so we have a zero in that a zero balance in that account. We don't show zero balance accounts in the trial balance normally. So we don't see it, so we assume that it's zero balance. We calculated net income from A here, so we can go to that slide and get the net income. And then we subtract our dividends, $600. Go here, net income is 2,490. So to calculate ending retained earnings for June 30th, we take our beginning of zero, add our net income, 2,490, subtract our dividends, 600. So 1,890 is our retained earnings. So throughout those three steps, we've calculated net income, show what um, the total assets were, we calculated total liabilities. So that's part of the balance sheet, not a complete balance sheet. And we're able to um, show what the ending retained earnings are by using the net income and the dividends. If we go back here, <clears throat> we have common stock of 14,000. So we could do a complete balance sheet now because we have common stock. We know what that is, 14,000. We know that ending retained earnings is the 1890. So that's 15,890, 15,890. If we were to add that to the 7,460 of our liabilities, we would equal our total assets, 23,350. So that's it for chapter three, the accruals and deferrals, the uh, accrual accounting versus cash basis accounting. Refer back to this PowerPoint uh, to see the examples and then review the notes. Um, we'll have more examples in there and we'll reinforce um, some of the concepts and get you prepared to do your homework. Thanks.